Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for Ask Baycare Clinic, our Facebook Live discussion series. We're joined today by Dr. John Slezik, otolaryngologist with Baycare Clinic Ear, Nose, and Throat, to discuss allergies and other sinus conditions. Thanks for being here, Dr. Slezik. Thank you for having me. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that we are taking live questions today. This is your time to interact directly with Dr. Slezik. If you have questions about allergies, allergy season, or other sinus conditions, we encourage you to ask them in the comments below. We'll incorporate your questions into our discussion today and answer them in real time. If we run out of time before answering your questions, we'll respond shortly after the live broadcast. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Slezik, let's start with you and a little bit about your background. Can you tell everyone a little bit about your specialty, what you commonly treat, and sort of what qualifies you to have this discussion today? Sure. Um, so, first, just a little bit about myself. I've been a Wisconsin native here for the last 20 years. Um, did training at the University of Wisconsin for medical school and then finished uh, my otolaryngology residency down at the University of Kentucky last summer. Um, as an ear, nose, and throat surgeon, we do kind of everything from the gamut of, um, you know, treating kids with fluid in the ears, tonsil infections, all the way up to, you know, head and neck cancer and thyroid cancer, things like that. A big portion of our practice does deal a lot with um, individuals who struggle with kind of chronic nasal problems, whether that be chronic nasal drainage, inability to breathe through the nose, um, or chronic sinus issues. So a lot of that incorporates allergies um, into, you know, all those symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we're talking about today specifically is allergies and, and maybe a little simplistic compared to the other conditions you just mentioned that you treat. But can you explain a little bit for everyone what allergies are and, and maybe how common of a problem this is for people? Sure. So, um, I mean, allergies are extremely common. It's probably estimated that about 25 percent of the, of the U.S. population experiences to some degree or another with allergies. Now, obviously, you know, some people experience it a lot more severely than others, but um, you know, just from the, the science background of what happens um, with allergies is that individuals that have a, um, a they're predisposed to, to having allergies, that they're exposed to something within their environment and then sets off an inflammatory reaction that anytime that they're exposed to that allergen uh, kind of later in their life, then they're going to start experiencing some of the classic symptoms that are associated with allergies. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into those symptoms in a minute, but is this something that any individual, any, any age individual can, can suffer from? Can anyone get allergies? Well, um, you can get people that will develop allergies a little bit later in life, um, but most of the time there's a strong family uh, history of individuals having allergies. So, for example, if, if one of your parents um, has allergies, then you've got about a 50% chance yourself of having allergies. So there's definitely a strong genetic component to it. Um, certainly, I hear a lot of individuals that will kind of move from one spot of the country to another and, and never really experienced um, any type of allergy symptoms in the place that they previously lived, but then when they moved elsewhere that they began experiencing symptoms. So it is certainly something that you can develop a little bit later in life. Mm -hmm. And we're talking, I think, I think there's a sort of a broad spectrum of allergies, right? So there can be specific triggers and, and seasonal allergies and those kind of things. What are some of the more common causes of allergies that, that as everyone knows them, that, that you're familiar with. Yeah, well, I mean, you can just look outside now and see all the cottonwood that's <laughs> out in the air, but um, it's, it's it's fairly seasonal dependent. Um, in the springtime, classically, you've got more of the pollens that come from the, the flowering trees uh -huh. that are the main triggers. Um, in the summertime, you, it's more of the grasses um, that cause more of the issues. And then kind of towards the end of summer, or early fall, that's when individuals that struggle more with like ragweed, um, that's that's when it becomes a lot more prevalent at that point. Um, there are, you know, there's you know, certain triggers, um, you know, all the ragweeds, the pollens, um, you know, some of the, the different types of trees that uh, cause a lot of these issues. Um, and it just kind of depended on where you are, or what those main those main allergens are. Yeah, absolutely, and and certainly geographic. I'm glad that you brought it up because my allergies have been going crazy lately. I'm sure I'm not the only one out there. What symptoms are typically present um, in someone who is suffering from allergies? What what kind of things are they dealing with? 
Yeah, so classic symptoms, you're going to have kind of itchy nose, runny eyes, um, kind of itchy eyes, um, nasal congestion, nasal drainage, lots of sneezing. Um, sometimes that nasal drainage can cause some throat irritation. Um, so people are, can have, you know, post nasal drainage with, you know, kind of some throat symptoms, feeling like something's in the throat that's not really there. Um, chronic throat clearing, um, chronic cough, things like that. Um, sometimes pressure or fullness within the within the you know the face as well if um, you know if it's blocking some of the sinuses. Um, but those are more or less the classic symptoms. We usually think of kind of nasal congestion, runny nose, sneezing, um, watery eyes, itchy eyes, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Those all sound very familiar to me. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk in a moment about um, the ways that ear, nose, and throat doctors like yourself can sort of identify and treat allergy symptoms in patients. But I want to first talk a little bit about how um, allergies, and you mentioned it earlier, can sort of be a precursor for other sinus conditions or, or problems that um, if they go untreated. So what types of things can allergies lead to if not properly treated? Yeah, so um, kind of I already alluded a little bit to it. So a lot of throat symptoms that we'll see will be, you know, from individuals that have kind of chronic post nasal drainage from um, from chronic allergies. Um, children especially can have um, a number of kind of consequences from it. So, um, you know, whether it be you know, inability to breathe through the nose, which then results in some symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, um, chronic ear infections or chronic fluid in the ear, which um, you know, as a as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, I usually take that really pretty seriously because you see kids that have fluid in the ear. That's like them walking around with earplugs, and so especially when they're little, um, it's all that language and development that is so important for their future growth and, and education. Um, if they've got chronic fluid in the ears, then you know it's one of the things that we like to be pretty aggressive at treating, just so that they can hear appropriately. But allergies have a very strong there's a very strong correlation with you know children with allergies and, and you know chronic fluid in the ear. Mm -hmm. um, there's you know there is a link with allergies and sinus. It's not really sure which one comes first, chicken or the egg, but you definitely see those kind of um, exist concurrently. Um, let's see. Uh, the, one of the biggest things that we see with with allergies and uh, kind of related to you know quality of life and symptoms is um, poor sleep. So a lot of people will have a really difficult time sleeping if their allergies are flaring up. And you know as um, as we all know, if we don't get a good night's rest, we can be pretty miserable the next day. And and so that. Um, individuals with, with pretty severe allergies can struggle significantly uh, from that regard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and we're going to get into this a little bit too, but I want to ask, how can a person sort of tell the difference between maybe allergies and a more serious sinus condition, or, or maybe that's something that you and, and your colleagues can help with? Yeah, I mean, it can be tough sometimes. Uh, a lot of the symptoms can can mimic one another. Uh, oftentimes it takes a, you know, a good to sit down and talk with the patient, see what the main symptoms are that they're experiencing. If it's more of the classic kind of sneezing, itchy eyes, um, you know, runny nose, things like that, or lead us more towards, you know, the allergy in addition to doing a good physical exam, which would include us looking kind of deep within the nose to make sure there's nothing else structural that's going on or something related to the sinuses um, that would be causing those symptoms. Um, it, it's, you know, it just takes a, you know, it just takes a little bit of time and trying to figure out what the, what the issues are with the patient. Um, but sometimes it just takes a good physical exam. Um, there's great diagnostic studies that we do as well. And, um, you know, allergy testing, I think is really important in that because um, as I said, you can have individuals who can very classically sound like they're having allergies and they're not having any, you know, any type of allergies at all. And so there are different nasal conditions that we see where people have very classic symptoms of, of you know, allergic rhinitis where, you know, everything is completely negative on, on the allergy um, panel. And that's just something that we have to become aware of and then uh, treat differently. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to get into a little bit of those treatment options in just a moment. but. Uh, if you are just joining us, we're here today with Dr. John Slezik, otolaryngologist with Baker Clinic Ear, Nose, and Throat. We're discussing allergies and other common sinus conditions. Uh, as a reminder, we are taking questions today, so feel free to ask them in the comments if you have them. If you don't have questions but you're liking the conversation, go ahead and give us a thumbs up just to let us know that you're following along today. 
Um, so you just talked a little bit about some of the allergies and some of the ear, nose, and throat conditions allergies can lead to if um, not properly treated or, or maybe, you know, the difference between them. But since allergies are so common, when do you recommend patients actually see a doctor regarding their allergies or if they suspect it's allergies? Right. Um, you know, so from the um, kind of the, the guidelines that we use, um, both within kind of the Society of Allergy, in addition to the, the Ear, Nose, and Throat Society that we have, it's it's generally kind of how how severe and persistent those symptoms are. So, you know, if it's an individual that really struggles, you know, maybe two weeks, you know, in the in the spring when all the, you know, trees are beginning to blossom, and and from that regard, then usually you can get away with just over the counter treatment. It really becomes more of an issue when you, if those symptoms are severe and they're not, you know, effectively treated with over the counter treatments or, um, you know, not really sure what those triggers are that, that cause you to have such severe symptoms. Um, and, and so it's, a lot of it is just kind of dependent on, on how much of it affects that quality of life. And certainly if it's, you know, you're, you're having other, you know, manifestations of the allergies, like, you know, some individual, individuals can develop asthma from them as well. Um, and so there's certainly a, there's certainly kind of a, a spectrum as far as how severe they can be. But, um, you know, I usually have a pretty low threshold. I mean, if there's questions, then to be able to, you know, ask someone who's got a little bit more experience than yourself, then, um, you know, certainly reaching out to either a primary care provider, um, an otolaryngologist or an allergist, it's usually a good first resource to kind of lead you in the right direction for treatment. Yeah, and that was that's an excellent segue because I wanted to ask you specifically because sometimes that can be a little confusing for people. Where should they start or can they start in any of those locations as far as reaching out to primary care? Or can they start right with someone like you? Yeah, I mean, I, I take self-referrals all the time. Um, so if, if someone, um, someone, I mean, if someone is interested, then I'd be more than happy to kind of speak to them about that medical side of things. Sometimes um, individuals will not only have allergies, but they'll also have, you know, other kind of anatomic um, obstructions within the nose that, you know, it doesn't matter how well you treat the, the allergies, you're still going to have nasal obstruction just because there's, you know, air can't get through because it's blocked. Um, and so it's, you know, it's obviously as a, as a patient kind of tough to know where to begin from that, from that standpoint, but, um, you know, otolaryngologists or the primary care or the allergists are all fairly well aware of, you know, some of those, um, you know, other, you know, other components that can kind of be on top of allergies. And so um, usually they're pretty good about having patients see us if they feel like something more is going on um, beyond yeah. just kind of your simple allergies. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about that from a, from a patient standpoint. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you and your colleagues would do if someone came in suffering from allergies? What does that What does that appointment look like? You mentioned it before, but let's talk a little bit about that process. Sure. So um, I always start with the good, you know, history. Try to figure out just exactly, you know, how long symptoms have been going on, what time of the year, um, what known triggers that they have, what sort of treatments have have been tried so far. Um, and then do a good physical exam, and usually that would include us using a small, um, a small endoscope to get a good look around the nose, just to make sure that there's nothing else kind of going on that can mimic allergies. Um, we can do allergy testing. Uh, there's a number of different ways in which you can do allergy testing. Sometimes you can just take like a blood sample and, and test the serum to determine uh, what the different you know, allergies and what, what type of antibodies you have within your body um, that are reacting to those specific allergens. Um, or you can also get like skin type of testing, which um, is usually very quick, very simple. It's, it's got very high, um, you know, sensitivity and specificity, um, which is just in, in medical terms, it's just very accurate as far as trying to figure out just what exactly it is that people suffer from. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a lot of it just kind of determines on uh, as far as what type of diagnostic steps we take as, you know, of, of what the patient has already done so far. Um, and if, if nothing has been done so far, you know, we kind of start from scratch and go from there. Yeah, and, and there are certainly several different treatment options that you guys can provide. Where do you start typically with with someone? And, and maybe it, it depends on what they've already done, but can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, um, I'm a big proponent of uh, nasal steroids when it comes to kind of the medical treatment of um, of allergies. I mean, that's been shown to be most effective. Um, on top of that, uh, what we do is uh, salt water rinses. So a lot of people either, you know, we recommend either a neti pot or um, I think what work a little bit better are actually these little nasal irrigation bottles that, you know, people can use. And, you know, the importance of that, um, it sounds kind of silly just to put salt water within your nose, but um, it's it is very effective at kind of washing all those different allergens out of the nose. Um, just so that they don't really, uh, number one, so that the cells can work the way that they need to, to kind of get all that mucus and junk out of there. Um, and then also so that the different allergens aren't stuck in the nose all day long, you know, in which they can kind of elicit that inflammatory response that causes the symptoms that they have. Um, I think over-the-counter medications can be very helpful. Um, it's some of the, you know, Benadryl has been used historically, but there tends to be a lot of side effects to it. And so I generally don't recommend that. Some of the newer uh, over-the-counter allergy medications like Allegra, Zizol, Zyrtec, things like that um, are generally very, very well tolerated and very effective for patients. Um, there are different types of nasal sprays that we can prescribe also that um, kind of act similarly, but more locally within the nose. Um, it's, it's just kind of depends on um, you know how effective we are able to get their, their allergies under control with kind of a, a more minimalist um, approach and then if they're still not having if they're still having issues from there then we kind of can ramp up therapy thereafter yeah yeah I want to talk about that we have some questions coming in um, one of them dealing with some of those over-the-counter medications um, that you had just brought up if, if someone has been taking them for a long time is it possible for the the body to sort of develop an immune approach to them where they don't work anymore? And then what would you recommend for those people? Yeah, um, I haven't seen that, um, especially with, with, with some some medications that we do, your body can, can develop a tolerance to it. Um, not so much with those, but I have, I have seen that people that, you know, they'll take Allegra and they, you know, for one reason or another, they don't get that great a benefit to it. And then they switch to a different medication that's the same class it just has a slightly different um, kind of chemical structure and they, and they can do very well with it. So that would be my recommendation would be just to try a different uh, medication within that same class and see if you get some um, relief of those symptoms from there. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned just in your, um, while you were talking a little bit earlier, sort of the next approach is stepping up some of that therapy. What would be the next um, thing that you and your team would, pro would, would try for, the, for some patients? Yeah, so there's, um, you can do intranasal um, antihistamine, so it's, it works very similar to the, the over-the-counter antihistamine drugs, but it's, it actually it acts locally, um, kind of within the nose. Um, if you have a lot of ocular symptoms, so eye symptoms, then you can do um, like antihistamine eye drops. Um, there's a there's different medications that kind of uh, work before the allergy system, the, the allergy season starts and it it helps kind of stabilize the different membranes of the cells that are one of the main uh, mediators for allergy and that's a medication that we can use if you know that you have really bad symptoms you know in a specific season then we can get you started on that medication before that season starts um, to try to help diminish those symptoms. Um, if the main symptoms are just kind of like persistent runny nose, then you know there's a different nasal spray that we have that kind of goes directly towards the, the mechanism to decrease the, the runny nose. Um, and then ultimately, if we're still really struggling with that, we've identified what the different you know allergens are um, and still not getting relief, then uh, doing a consideration for what's called immunotherapy, where uh, we get you set up with the allergist who then develops um, kind of a, a treatment protocol for you to um, get desensitized to the allergen over the course of time. And so that can be done uh, either through like weekly uh, shots of the different allergens that you kind of gradually increase the dose of those allergens so that your body gets used to it. And then so your body develops um, kind of these counteracting antibodies uh, to it. And so that they're no longer having those, those symptoms when they get exposed to those allergens. Um, or you can actually do different um, like immunotherapy drops under the tongue. Um, and those are something that you can take daily and you don't have to get a shot. So 
that's um, you know that's kind of the, the the people that are have symptoms all the time and um, really aren't getting relief with standard medical treatment that we always have that option. Um, it's a it's a good option. It just takes a little bit of time. It usually takes about two to three years before people are starting to get you know pretty significant relief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it, the key word there was just options. So there are there are options for people out there who are suffering from allergies and, and persistent allergies. Um, some of the other questions that we have coming in are, are related to children. And um, this is something that you guys can provide for children as well, right? They, they, they have options as well. They don't need to suffer with allergies either, correct? No, no, um, not at all. Um, you know, we can do low dose nasal steroids on children. Um, you know, there's, they're generally very well tolerated. Um, there's not much systemic absorption um, really at all, especially with some of the newer formulations of the nasal steroids. And so some of the concerns that we have with children with, with you know, giving kids, you know, steroids um, are, are not really that much of a concern with some of the newer formulations of the nasal steroids. Um, but, you know, sometimes with, with kids especially, they could have, really big tonsils and adenoids. And so what people are treating consistently as, as being allergies, maybe they're just obstructed and can't breathe because they've got big tonsils and big adenoids. And that's something that we can remove and, and take out and, and take care of. So certainly with kids, we're more than happy to see them and evaluate them and try to figure out what's going on and, and hopefully get them feeling better. Because you know, and then the same way that I talked about earlier about kids with fluid in the ear and, and having a hard time with speech and language development, the same goes with kids that aren't sleeping well at night because they can't breathe. I mean, if they're not sleeping well and they're tired during the day, they're not able to pay attention at school. Um, there's There can be you know learning deficits as a result of that, behavioral problems as a result of that. And so um, it, it can be you know, very much affect um, their quality of life and, and, and their future if it's you know severe enough. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you said it there perfectly in that allergies can sometimes be consistent with other symptoms for other conditions and they may be treating it as allergies, but it may not be. So that's when it's important to sort of come in and see you guys not deal with it, just deal with it, right? Well, yeah, it's if if what you're doing to treat it is not working, then maybe we should reevaluate what it is that you're treating and make sure that we've got the correct diagnosis. Absolutely. Um, you had talked about it briefly, but I want to circle back to some of those sort of chronic issues. I mean, allergies are typically a seasonal thing, and if it is more chronic, what are some of the other um, things that untreated allergies may cause? So you had mentioned ear infection, fluid in the ear, those kinds of things. Um, if allergies are a persistent thing, what are some of the other problems that can occur? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer it kind of in two parts. So that you can have seasonal allergies or perennial allergies. A lot of the perennial allergies of what you have and you know, experiencing all year round, we see that a lot more common with things within the house. Um, so whether that be like dust mites within the home, um, you know, pet dander. Sometimes people can have mold within the home that can kind of set off people's allergies. Um, and so you know that's a an ongoing all the time thing. And so uh, trying to figure out what exactly those you know those are so that you can. You know, do things kind of within the local environment to try to decrease your exposure to them would be helpful. Um, but chronic symptoms, chronic allergies, um, you know, we kind of alluded a little bit to her earlier as far as some of the medical consequences that can come from that. Um, you know, there is a correlation between allergies and asthma. Um, a lot of this, the same immune response that occurs, you know, for people that have allergies will occur down in the lungs, um, kind of a hyperreactivity reaction down in the lungs. And so, um, you know, making sure that we're, you know, effectively treating both, you know, both, you know, the asthmatic portion of it in addition to kind of your, your sinonasal portion of the allergies is very important. Um, you know, you can have you know, issues with, Kind of chronic sore throats, chronic throat issues, um, problems with your speech, sometimes even problems with swallowing just because you have inflammation in the back of the throat from all the, the junk that's coming out of the nose and irritating the tissues down there. Uh, we do see a fair, lot, a fair amount of that. Um, chronic sinus is issues are ubiquitous. Uh, it's not, you know, we're not necessarily sure if the allergies are causing the sinus issues or if you've got sinus issues that then kind of exacerbate the allergies, but we certainly see them exist, you know, um, together. You know, there are certain um, 
you can develop certain uh, chronic sinus disease secondary to allergies to mold that we get exposed to, um, and that, that can be pretty serious. Uh, you can have pretty serious um, sinus infections from that, um, in addition to fairly significant symptoms from that of, you know, having large polyps within the nose, um, sinuses being completely full of just junk from, the, you know, the reaction to, to the uh, reaction to the molds that are causing all those allergies. Um, but, you know, any, anything in your nose that can cause um, kind of chronic inflammation can block up those sinuses, allow bacteria to set up shop. Those bacteria then are going to cause chronic inflammation, and that, that chronic inflammation has caused a lot of, a lot of those symptoms that we see uh, for our science patients. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as we're as we're nearing the end of our discussion today, I want to sort of leave people um, with with some suggestions um, on ways to feel better. I think for us here in northeastern Wisconsin, it seems like the spring allergy season never really went away. <laughs> Still, it's still you know in in full force here, and then fall is coming right around the corner too. So, um, what are some steps that you suggest people start with in order to feel better, and and when should they come and see you? Sure. So, um, you know, any discussion about allergy treatments not complete without discussion of kind of some of the avoidance things that we can do at home, and some of the things that um, we can do to try to decrease the amount of exposure that we have to allergens. So. Um, you know, particularly at this time of year, especially with it being as hot as it is outside, be, you know, trying to stay, if, um, if your symptoms are flaring up outside, trying to stay out, uh, stay inside uh, more frequently, um, use the air conditioner, keep the windows shut, um, getting like a, a high, um, high efficiency HEPA filter um, within your home can be very, very helpful to um, basically get a lot of those allergens up out of the air. Um, for people that have allergies to their pets, um, I'm a big pet person, so I would, you know, I would do a lot of drastic measures before I'd ever get rid of my pets. But uh, a lot of it is um, trying to, you know, get carpeting out of the main living areas um, of the home, especially you know within your bedroom, um, just so that all that pet dander can't set up shop there. Um, and then, you know, for individuals with like dust mites, making sure that you are washing your sheets at a high temperature, usually over about 130 or 140 degrees Fahrenheit once a week. Um, having like the, the hypoallergenic covers for both the mattress and your pillows. Um, and then um, like trying to keep humidity at a relative level, usually between, you know, around 50%, uh, just so that you don't get significant mold buildup within the home. So those are kind of first steps of what you can do, um, you know, at home. I think it's it is important to kind of have an idea of, of what your your allergic triggers are, so that you can kind of better tailor the different things that you do at at home to decrease your allergen load. So I am a big proponent of getting skin tested for you know for your allergies. It's it's safe. It's effective. Um, it is. It's very accurate. And, um, and so a lot of times just by, you know, having a little bit of knowledge, we can, you know, take measures and steps to try to, um, you know, try to mitigate our exposure to, uh, to those things um, over time. Yeah, absolutely. And you had mentioned it earlier too. I mean, I think the key component here is, is for people not to suffer. So if they are having issues and, and some of the measures that they've taken aren't working, they can certainly come and see you, uh, request an appointment to see you and, and maybe at least get the knowledge of what maybe is triggering those allergies to, you know, to help them make better informed decisions, right? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to see anyone in my clinic and, um, you know, it's, if it's um, you know straightforward allergies, then we're more than happy to treat those. Um, if there's something more going on, like a septal deviation that's also con you know contributing to people not being able to breathe through the nose, then we address that. Um, any sort of chronic sinus issues, we of course um, we, we will treat the whole gamut of that within our department, and so uh, we're more than happy to discuss it with anyone. Absolutely. Dr. Slezik, we've covered quite a bit today. Is there anything else that you want to add or anything that you want to leave our viewers with? Um, I don't have a whole lot, just that uh, obviously this is the time of year where symptoms are worse. And so uh, I'm a big proponent of salt water in the nose. And so using that liberally, you're not going to harm yourself, can be very helpful in, in, and, uh, in helping take care of some of those symptoms in addition to over-the-counter nasal steroids. They're very helpful. Absolutely. 
Well, thank you so much for spending us some spending time with us today, Dr. Slezik. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Well, and thank you everyone for watching. Again, Dr. Slezik is an otolaryngologist with Bay Care Clinic Ear, Nose, and Throat. He currently sees patients in Green Bay and Kakana. To be alerted about live content from Bay Care Clinic, be sure to like us on Facebook and click on the bell icon below to subscribe. Uh, if you have additional questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments. We'll continue to answer them online after today's broadcast. And if you want to learn more about Bay Care Clinic or request an appointment, visit baycare.net. Thanks for joining us and have a great day.